Hello everyone, today is the third stream that we are where we are building a custom app in Webflow and we decided that the, the topic of the app was Pokemon. So we had two streams up, to, up until now. The first stream was uh, we, we explained how to deal with templates in Webflow, how to interact with DOM elements and clone them. The second stream, which was last Friday, we focused on fetching the data from an API, which by the way, it's Okay, API, it's a free public RESTful API that you can consume for any phone project that you have. And today, I think that we're ready to start adding more features to the app. I want today to not only focus on having a simple list on the page with a bunch of Pokemons, I want to be able to click on its Pokemon and see information about it. Ideally, today, we'll see how to create template pages not template elements to create leads, but actual template pages just from scratch with cut, uh, custom coding and an external source. That's a sweet. So far, we just have a simple page that contains a template element. And that template element defines all of the items that are rendered um, one item per Pokemon. So this template item is used for cloning um, uh, the item for each Pokemon and then we populate the data with the Pokemon data and we render it on the page. Um, if you haven't checked that, just go ahead and watch the previous streams because uh, I think it's interesting to know. So, and so far the functions that we have is just a simple um, initial Webflow push callback so we can run um, logic after Webflow has initialized. We grab a template, we fetch the data, then we create the new items from the template item that we're cloning, and then we append the items to the list, and that's it. That's what we have so far, okay? Before moving on, I want to do a couple refactors here. Because you probably can already see that if we keep coding and coding and coding here, this is going to become super long and really hard to grasp, you know, hard to understand. So the first thing before creating the template page that I think we should do is take this code and refactor it a little bit so we are organized and then we can move on. So we basically we have two things in here. Well, actually three things that's go that are going on in the application. The first one is obviously that the application is loading and it's running. Right, it's the first entry point, the moment that we call the app into run. Okay. Then the next thing is how we fetch the Pokemons. And that, that one is actually kind of already prepared because we have this fetch Pokemons data function that it's pretty convenient. Um, and then the last one is we are creating the new items, right? And obviously we are pending that, that we are creating the new items. So I think that the first thing that we can do is this item's creation, how we take the template I, uh, element and we generate new elements from it, could be a function just because organization, right? We can just call create new items. And uh, this is one recommendation that, uh, that I will give you if you're ever coding. I think that it's really easy to understand a system when you're defining what's going on in your code. So it's different to understand in the first in the first grasp imagine that you're reading this and you want to understand what's going on right it's way easier to understand if you just see this like populate pokemons and you and imagine that you just had that fetch pokemons data and populate pokemons data whatever when you see that at the first at the first glance, it's like, okay, I understand what's going on. We're fetching the Pokemon's data and we're populating the Pokemon. Cool, that's it. I don't need to spend any more time reading the code. But if you just see like a lot of lines like this, you're like, whoa, okay, I need I need to take some time to understand the read it of the lines so then I can, you know, uh, process the information and come up with the idea that, uh, okay, we're fetching the Pokemon's data and we're populating it. So I'm going to extract that. And I'll start by just extracting this bit of code as a function. 
Okay, we are looping through the Pokemon's data, and for each of the Pokemon's data, we're creating a new Pokemon item. So I could create a function that is called create Pokemon item. Let me disable Copilot again. Sorry. Create Pokemon item, and please be disable. I think now. Okay, this can be a function, and inside this function, I want to just do this. I want to take one Pokemon data. So I want to take the Pokemon data. Actually, I can just copy this because this is the, the entry. This is Pokemon data. Okay. And from this, I want to return an HTML element. Okay. But I, I, I don't need to explicitly define that, but I know that I, from this function, I want to return the new item that I've created, right? So let's take this and just move it inside this function like that. Obviously now it's got to complain because, hey, the item template variable, it's not accessible in, in these new function. So I need to pass it to it. I can say as a new function argument, I can say item template, it's going to be equals to an HTML element. And actually it's not an HTML element. We can be more specific because I believe that it's a HTML anchor element, which belongs to a link tag, the open, the A tag. Uh, where am I? Here. So instead of an HTML element, it's an anchor element. And now if you, if we hover on the function, over the function, we can see that this function, it's taking the Pokemon data, it's taking the item template, and then it's returning an HTML anchor element. So TypeScript is smart enough to know what's going in and what's going out of the function without me having to explicitly define it. But actually the, the inputs we are, because we have to define what we want, but TypeScript can infer where we're returning from the function. So this call, we have the function, and now I can improve this a little bit by getting rid of all of it and just say, create Pokemon item. And this is going to be the Pokemon data that we have to pass here. And also the item template like this. So now it's a little bit easier to understand, right? Because now instead of having to read all of this, you just have to read this in here, which is we get the Pokemon's data, we get the item template, we get the items list, we remove the template, we create new Pokemon items for each Pokemon uh, data, and we append it to a list. I think it's a cool, it's a good start, right? Um, so for now, this, this has been a little improvement, but I think that we can do a little bit better. The first thing is imagine that, actually, let's, let's, let's move these functions away. Let's put them somewhere else. Let's say, I'm going to say, I want to reorganize because right now we're just on the home page. But the next step is to create the, the template page, which means that we will have multiple pages. Um, so in my code base, I want to be, I want to stay organized and also be clear about what, what piece of code belongs to what page. It could be something that it's for the entire project, but it could be something that it's just for the home page. Or it could be something that it's just for a template page, right? So I want to uh, reflect that in my code base. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder and call it this home, for example. Okay. And this home, let me just grab this index file and put it in the home page. Because then I know that everything that is going on in this index file, it just belongs to the home page. That's it. So um, that's completely fine. Um, but then obviously I have to edit the entry point because you can see that my, my terminal is already complaining like, Hey, I cannot resolve the index file This is because I've moved it. And we can solve that by going into the build script that just looks for the scripts that it has to build. And we're going to update this from source index. We're going to update it to source home index like this, and I'll just kill the process and run it again. The npm that let's make sure that we have everything correct. We do. Um, okay. That's the first thing. And now that I have it on the home, I can 
I can just keep organizing stuff. Uh, fetching Pokemon's data. Now we we have a small conflict here because right now I just have a function that it, that fetches all the Pokemon's for for the list that I want to show in in the homepage, right? But the moment that I go to the template page, imagine that this is already built and it's clickable. The moment that I click on Bulbasaur, I want to visit a template page that just uh, talks about Bulbasaur. Which means that at that point, I will have to retrieve the data just for Bulbasaur, not for all the items. And if you think of it, if you if you came to the, the previous streams, we already did that. In the fetch Pokemon's data, we first get the list of the Pokemon's but then for each Pokemon that we retrieve, we do an additional call to fetch the, that, that entire Pokemon data. Because these, these initial fetch just returns the, the Pokemon names and the URL of each Pokemon. But that's it. It doesn't return anything else. Um, for If we want to retrieve all the data from a Pokemon, like pictures, stats, uh, weight, height, uh, abilities, blah, blah, blah we have to make an additional fetch um, request to the URL that's specific to that Pokemon. And it, this is what's happened, what happens in here when we do this try catch. We get the URL, okay? And then we, we wait for a response. So the way that it's defined is um, Pokemon, Pokemon 1, Pokemon 2, Pokemon 3, Pokemon 4. So it's the ID. Probably. Right? Because this is Pokemon 1 and it's Bulbasaur. And if I check it, uh, where can I see the ID or whatever? Ability Snow, Form Snow, Game in this says ID. So this ID, it's what's defining is in here. But also, we already have it in here. So I think that we can create an additional function that can be used both for, for the home page and for the template page. And that function, it's gonna just care about fetching the data from a single Pokemon. Okay, so let's do it, let's do it now. Let's just extract from here, and I'll create an additional function down here, and call it fetch Pokemon, not Pokemons, but Pokemon data. And stay with me. I know that this might be confusing, but I have a reason to do this. And we'll just define a parameter for URL. Right, because that's yeah, is a real URL, and I'll copy exactly this, which is, it tries to fetch the URL, and then the data belongs to the Pokemon data, and if it succeeds, then it returns the Pokemon data, but if it fails, it returns null, like not it doesn't return anything. Okay, well, null is actually something; it's something that it's nothing. <laughs> it's a little bit weird. Um. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so fast Pokemon data, and now in here I can replace this. So instead of having this, I can say fetch the Pokemon data with the URL, and now we simplify a little bit this fetch Pokemon's data, and also we have an additional function that we will be able to use when we when we create the template page. So yay, big win for us. Now, let's go back to the reorganizing thing. Um, how can we reorganize stuff? Okay, let's remember. This create Pokemon item, it's specific to the home page. This fetch Pokemon's data, it's also specific to the home page. But this fetch Pokemon data, it's not specific to the home page. This is actually specific to any anywhere, right? Because um, you can use it on the home page, you can use it on the template page, you can use it. And actually, if we think of it, fetch Pokemon's data, it's not specific to the homepage. You could be, you could want to fetch Pokemon's data somewhere else in the app too. Could make sense. So I think that, for example, we could create a utils, a uh, new file in utils that's just called API, for example. Or it depends because, you know, I this is something that I always use to, like when I'm building a project, I would organize the, the, the files in the project a million times, because <laughs> every time that I'm building something new, that maybe I realize, oh, 
but now it makes sense to to have a new folder that contains that or it makes sense to take this and just move it away to a more global uh, place i don't know i'm i'm constantly reorganizing stuff so i think i hope that i'm, I'm I, I don't uh, make any about math cuz <laughs> i like to really move stuff around but for now let's just create an api you know here okay and this api you know can have the fetch Pokemon's data and the fetch Pokemon data. I'll just take this, I'll cut it, and I'll put it in the API.cs. Okay, cool. But now we have an additional problem, right? Let's put it, because now the the um, there are some variables, some things that are not accessible. These types, I also think that they should not be on the root of the project. They should be somewhere else. And I think that utils is the perfect because it's somewhere that it's accessible from the entire project. So types in the utils folder that contains the type definitions for the, all the data from it, the Pokemons. Now let's just import this because it's missing. I'm importing this and I'm importing this. It's missing this fu helper function. It's not an empty. It's also, and that's it. Actually, that's it. And now the last thing that we have to fix is, okay, now that we've moved these functions somewhere else, the, we still have to, to, to access them from this, from this folder, from this place, sorry. So I have to import them. So when you have, uh, when you're working with ESM, with ES modules, um, you, you can essentially share the, uh, share methods and properties between different files, but you have to explicitly define them as exported from somewhere. So if I try to, for example, from this index file, I try to access something from the API folder, uh, from this API file, I can only access it if we explicitly define it to be exported. So I can have to come here and say export const and then uh, the, the function. And I'll do the same here. I'm going to say export like this. And now I am able to access it. That's Pokemon's data. See how VS Code already is already smart enough to know where where he has to go and fetch it. I can get rid of this because it's not used like that. This create Pokemon item. Well, I think that for now we can leave it here, but I, I would probably do some extra refactoring if I had enough time. <laughs> but I think that we can keep it like that. So remember that we extracted the, the logic in functions because we want to encapsulate a piece of code that it's running and it's it's performing a specific action. We encapsulate it in a function. But imagine that understanding what the function does, it's not really straightforward. You know, maybe because it's a little bit complex or maybe because, you know, it's not easy to transmit the purpose of a function by just the name. You actually have to do some extra description. Um, there's a way to do that. And here's an example. So if I hover over my function, I cannot see anything. I, I can just see, see the, the function name and the parameters and the return statement. This is something that TypeScript already provides out of the box, but I don't have any additional information here. But if, for example, I check document query selector, which is a function that it's built in, so it has full information. If I hover over it, see what, see what I have here. I actually have some description that I can check. And it's just saying, returns the first element that is a descendant of a node that matches selectors. What do I have to do if I want to also add some description in my function so I can just hover over it and understand what's going on. I can read the description. Okay, so um, what we want to use, it's something called JSDoc. Hey, you can you can look it up in Google. JSDoc, it's a convention for comments that define um, multiple aspects of something, not only functions, but variables or anything else uh, in the JavaScript language. Okay, and let me show you how JS doc looks like. Maybe I can. So JS doc looks like this. And we, we, we will write it in a second. JS doc, it's instead of being a regular comment like this, JS doc 
it uses the expanded, I don't know how to call this type of comments, but I'll just call it expanded type comment. It uses this uh, expanded format. And inside this format, we have a bunch of keywords that we can use to define um, stuff that are uh, um, properties of the function. Let me show you a bunch of them. Um, so let me just go here. And in VS Code, you have a quick short shortcut. I think it's by it's done by Emmet. Well, I don't know if it's spilled in VS Code, but you can just type forward slash asterisk asterisk. And when you do the second asterisk, I already got a suggestion to to create JS, uh, JS comment, so I can hit enter. And now this already creates a JS comment for me. That it, it kind of pre-populates everything already. Okay. And if I write anything, this is a cool description like this. Now, if I fetch over the function, look what I have here. This is a cool description. And I also get the params like this. And ideally, you would also get the return. Yeah, it's cool, right? <laughs> so in this description, I always use this because then it's a cool way. It's a good way to, to describe something, right? So. For example, this is a cool description. Instead, I can say this function fetches uh, a list of Pokemons and their data, whatever. Okay. And I can keep adding more information like, okay, param, the limit. I can add some description here. Like, okay, defines the limit of Pokemons to be fetched. And now that I've added this description, when I fetch over the function, I can see that. I can see that the limit defines this. And it's this is really good, especially when you're working on a team or when you're creating a library that other developers are going to use. Check, for example, Finster TS Utils. That's a library. It is a, an external library that I created um, that, that it's reusable. And obviously, people who are using the library need to understand um, Every every single method or or uh, property that that is in the the variable. So, for example, is not empty. I can hover over it, and it has some description. Make sure that the value is not null and undefined. Blah blah blah. This description is something that I added in the past. In you can even include examples. See what see how this includes an example, and you can use it. If we go here, this is how it's done. This is a JS doc comment that I included. So, really cool to use, and I really encourage you to to use it, especially for maintenance of a project. It, this is something that it's fully uh, uh, compatible in VS Code, and also you don't have to worry about compiling. So imagine that because right now we are compiling the files because we have we are using TypeScript, but imagine that I was writing just plain JavaScript. JS that comments are compatible. You don't have to compile them at all. You you can just ship JS, JS comments to the browser and it's completely fine. So offset, I just want to say define the offset uh, item, the offset number with the Pokemons that are fetched, whatever. And I can also define a return statement, like, okay, this returns an array of, and look, for example, I can add this cool, this cool directive, the link, Pokemon data. And now look what happens, because I've added this link in here, like this. When I hover, it returns an array of Pokemon data, and I can click on it, and it brings me to the the definition of Pokemon data. Actually, that's wrong. Brings me to the import Pokemon data. That's interesting. Yeah, but still, you can you can add stuff with link. And I recommend if you really like this, I recommend that you check the JS Doc official page uh, where they explain about every single directive that you can use. All of this, all of this, are directives properties that you can use in JSOC. Okay, so that's going to be this. And then fetch Pokemon data, fetches the data for a specific specific Pokemon. Like that. 
And this is the URL of the Pokemon's AP tree point and returns a Pokemon data object, for example. Cool. So now we have full definitions. Our OCD, <laughs> it's a little bit more stable now. And we are a little bit more calm. We can move on. <laughs> cool. Actually, we could do the same here. Like it creates, I'm not going to do everything because for all the functions, because then I would, I would spend the whole stream doing that. It uh, creates now item for the Pokemon's list, whatever. And this is a Pokemon data. Uh, yeah, we can get rid of it. Let's do what I wanted to do, which is, um, Create a template page for each of the Pokemons. Okay. So first of all, let's just dive into the, the API. This is the, the response for Bulbasaur. And let's see the data that we're getting from the Pokemon. So we can decide what to use in, in, uh, when we create the page, what we can, what can we display? So we have the abilities, base experience, forms, let's see, abilities. Worms. Okay. Gaming this says we probably don't care about this. Height. Um moves. This one can be huge, probably. Yeah. This one is the biggest one. Because you can have a lot of um yeah, eighty three items, that's too much. Species, sprites, that's for the pictures, stats. So it's HP, attack, defense, special attack, okay, and types. So what? how about we just have the name, the picture, height, and weight, and stats. So uh, um, HP, attack, defense, special attack, special defense, and speed. I think that's good enough, right? Because I don't want to, you know, spend a lot of time just building the template. Okay, so let's create the template page. And look how I'm not going to use the CMS template pages. I'm just going to create a static page. That static page, it's going to be populated dynamically for the Pokemon that we're loading. Okay, so I'll just take the home page and I'll duplicate it for convenience. And I'll say... Pokemon, because this is going to be the page specific for each Pokemon. Hey, um, we can get rid of the list. We can keep the heading and let's remember what I said. I want to show the name, the picture, the height and weight and the stats. So let's do it super quick. I'll just, let me grab an image. Maybe we can do it like this. I think it's fine. This is going to be the name. Let's just define it like this. Let's just add some margin bottom here. Whoops. Margin medium is fine. Then margin X, not large. It was large. Okay, cool. And then I just put one box for the height and, and weight. Yeah, and then one box for the stats. And I think that that's, that's fine. So let's just say that this is going to be um, Pokemon props component. And this is just going to contain not a designer. So I apologize if I'm doing stuff horribly. Ugly. <laughs> so this is going to be height, blah, and actually we can just leave it like that. This and weight. Like that. And let's just set it, set some gap, couple rams, maybe. Okay. This can be bold. This can be bold. Cool. So and we probably have to define a span here because we want to target each element. So in, in this span, we will render the height of the Pokemon. And in this span, we will render the weight of the Pokemon. 
So this is Pokemon props like this. I I think that we can just put everywhere. Uh, just reuse the same thing for everywhere. Um. So stats. Let's just grab a couple stats. Let's grab HP. HP. And we'll do the same for attack. I think that's probably going to look better if we do a list like this. Yeah, much better. And um, what else? Attack, defense, and speed. Let's just use these. So this is going to be defense and speed. That's it. That's our super cool designer approved template. <laughs> Pokemon page template. Okay. Picture, title with a name, and then a bunch of stats. That's it. So we have to define a selector for each of the elements, right? Because we want we, we need to target them with JavaScript. So I'll just come here and say data element equals to I don't know. Pokemon image and this is going to be the element equals to Pokemon name and I have to copy and paste a bunch of times but Pokemon height this is the, the moment where I would play um, elevator music <laughs> Why are you waiting? Because it's a little bit tedious. The element Pokemon HP. And I'm just gonna do a little, um, you know, call this the same exact way that it's called in the API. Like this. Because then it's it's gonna be easier to to target each element. Pokemon HP, data element, Pokemon attack, data element, Pokemon defense, and the last one, and we get to go, data element speed, Pokemon speed. Okay, cool, published. So, let's just grab this URL. Wait one second until it's published. Now that I have the template page, so imagine that we're coming from the home page, and then each of these items, they all are going to be pointing to the same page, same page for each each Pokemon. But somehow I have to identify what Pokemon I need to fetch and load, so I can display the the information here. So what's the best approach? How how would you do that? I want to play the, the Pokemon page here. Publish it. So what the, the one way that we can identify Pokemon is by loading them in the query branch. So in, in this URL, it's not only going to be this. Let me just put it here so you can see better. It's not only going to be this, but also we'll include in, in its query prime with the ID, like one, two, three, four, five, whatever. Because then we can use that ID for fetching the Pokemons. But let's do that. Now, each one of the Pokemons, I'm already rendering them on the page. But the URL is just pointing. Let me show you. The URL of each one, it's just pointing to the Pokemon page. So we have to edit this URL to include the query param in the in the um, the URL. Okay, let's do that. Home page, we go to the create Pokemon item function, and in here, the item that we've cloned, we know that the item is the anchor element. It's the the A tag, this one. So this item is the one where we want to grab the href and update this URL to not only be slash Pokemon, but to be slash Pokemon question mark ID equals to the ID of the Pokemon. We want to do this. Okay? Because then when we load the page, whoops, whoops. When we load the page, we already have the program in place. So 
I just have to. I mean, let's do this. I'll grab the item and I'll build a new URL from it. URL and I'll grab the item href. We'll create a new URL and the URL will say search params append ID and we'll take the ID from the Pokemon data. We actually already have it. ID. Oh, but it's a number. We have to convert it to string like that. Okay. So we kind of already doing it. I think we're, there's no ID element, which is fine. But so essentially the only thing that we've done is we've taken this item, we've grabbed the href and we've appended an ID query param to it by using the search params uh, API. And if you don't know about this, I explained it in the last stream. In the last stream, I made a deep explanation about the URL constructor from JavaScript. It's really handy when you have to deal with URLs. So let me refresh. And if we inspect this, oh, actually, we have not set it. I have to item href, it's equals to the URL to stream like this. So I have to explicitly define that the new URL, it's this one. And now we have it. So now we have the URL for each one with the ID in place. So ID1, ID2, ID3, ID4, ID5. And we can visit this. Cool. So last bit that it's missing is we have to load the, the data of the Pokemon and we have to then populate it, right? But let's do that. I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to say... Pokemon template like this. And I'll create a new index file. And in here, the first thing that we want to do is let me just say because yeah, you, you'll see look, I'll just do the easy thing, but then if I have time, I'll, I'll explain how we can improve it. So for now, I'll just copy the Webflow push stuff like this. And this is going to be an async function. Okay. Um, and here, we have to do a couple of things. First of all, get the Pokemon ID from the URL, right? Because we, we are loading the page. The first thing that we have to do is identify, okay, what's Poke what Pokemon are we dealing with? Pokemon number one, because it's in, in the core brands. So grab the Pokemon ID and then fetch the Pokemon data, and then populate the Pokemon data. And see see how I'm, um, I'm defining the steps? This is pr probably the best way uh, to think like, hey, can I, how can I break this down into functions? This could be the perfect explanation. Like, I have three actions, get the Pokemon ID, fetch the Pokemon data, populate the Pokemon data. So these could totally be three different functions where I explain, okay, grab the Pokemon ID, fetch the Pokemon data, and populate the Pokemon data. This is just one recommendation that I give you. Always think about breaking down the bits of, of the code so it makes sense when you organize it in, into functions. But for now, just to be quick, I'll just create this, yeah, so do this super quick in here. So first of all, get the Pokemon ID from the URL. We have to get the search params, these search params, and extract the, the ID. So I'll just create a new URL, see how this URL constructor is really useful. And I'll create it from the window location href. So I'm essentially saying, hey, please create a new URL object, a new URL instance from the current, from the current location, this location. And now from this URL, I can say, hey, search params, and I want to get the ID. Okay, so I can say const ID equals to the ID from the query params. But something could happen here, and it's that maybe the ID is not in place. When the ID is not in place, I'm just going to stop running anything else because it means that we cannot identify the Pokemon. We could do something else like redirect the user on the home page. Actually, let's do that. Window location replace that. 
for example. So then if the IE is missing, we're just gonna send the user to the to the homepage. Like, hey, you cannot visit this. We cannot identify this Pokemon. That's a good thing to, to manage it. So now that we have the ID, we can fetch the Pokemon data. Okay. And if you recall, we created a very convenient function that it's called finds Pokemon data. <laughs> that it's in our utils, right? And this fetch Pokemon data, it's just expecting a URL. And this URL, let me just go back to the, the template page. Let's inspect one second. This URL, it looks like this. PokeAPI.co, API, B2, Pokemon, and then the ID. Same in here, same in here, same in here. It's the same for each one of them. So I can just grab this URL and say, Pokemon data, it's equals to await fetch Pokemon data. And we can just add this in here, like this. And the only thing that we have to do is now replace this ID for the ID of the Pokemon. We can add this and use template strings. This is a template string when we do, we're using these backticks and inject a variable inside the template string, which is the ID. And now this URL, it's going to be dynamically populated with the ID that comes from the Pokemon. And then we can fetch the Pokemon data from that URL. Cool. And we'll do the same. Pokemon data could potentially fail. We could have a problem when fetching it from, uh, from the server. So I'll just do the same that I did before. If there is no Pokemon data, just send the user to the homepage. It's fine. No data, no party. <laughs> and that's it. Okay, cool. And last thing, populate the Pokemon data. This is something that we've already done in the past. We just have to grab the elements from the page, the image, the name, uh, the height, the weight, the HP, the attack, the bands, and speed, and just inject it on the page. So let's do that super quick. Let's start by saying image element. It's going to be equals to document query selector. And this is using a CSS selector for attributes. And this one, it's called Pokemon image, like that. And I want to define this as an HTML image element. So TypeScript knows about this type of element and we can work with it properly. Let me just blah, 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 blah. do a bunch of them. So this is going to be Pokemon name. And it's a heading element, I think. Right? Yeah, it's a heading. And then it's going to be... I just want to grab this and this. I'm going to do that, I think, with control. No, there was a way of doing it, but I forgot. Anyways, uh, height, height element, and this is an HTML span. Let me grab this and copy it like this. So height, weight, attack, first it comes HP, HP, let me move it up. And this is going to be defense and speed. Defense and speed, like that. Cool. We have all the elements. Um, image element is an HTML it's image element. The name element is a heading element. And then each one of the properties, height, weight, HP, attack, etc., are just span, which are this one in here. That's it. The only thing missing now is just populating the data. So we can say, for example, if we have an image element, remember that I check for the elements always before interacting with them because we are in Webflow and working in Webflow means that somebody could come and decide that they don't want to have an image anymore <laughs> and now your code is completely broken. So instead of allowing this type of stuff to happen, we prepare beforehand for it and just check to make sure, okay, is that image going to be there? We don't know. So let's, let's check for it. So if there is an image element, let's say that the image element source 
it's going to be the Pokemon data, the, what was it? I forgot. Let me check. Because we did the same for the home page. This one. I'll just copy it. And say Pokemon data. And this is also Pokemon data. That. Cool. Okay. Let's quickly do the rest. Name element. If there's a name element, so the name element, the text content, it's going to be Pokemon data, that name, like that. And uh, let's make a few copies. This could be obviously improved, refactored to be more efficient than what I'm doing now. But for now, I think it's fine. So name element, I'm just going to say height element. What's the issue here? Oh, height is a number. Check how, see how TypeScript already, it's it's smarter than me. <laughs> TypeScript knows that this property is a number, but text content is expecting to have text. That's why I'm getting this squeak, squeaky line. So I have to transform this to string like that. Cool. Okay. Wait. So the same. Wait. And also has to be a string like that. Okay. And now the, the, the next ones. This is going to be a little bit different. So we have the HP element and we have to grab it from stats. And oh, shoot. Right. We'll have to do it a little bit different because stats is an array. See how stats is an array. And each one of uh, the items of the array is an object that contains the, the stat properties. So instead of doing this, of fetching, getting, grabbing each item individually, I'll do it a little bit different. I'll loop, I'll loop through the Pokemon data stats. Pokemon, oh, come on. Pokemon data stats. Now we're talking. Okay. Let me get rid of this for a second. So in, instead of going manually grabbing each item, I'll just go and loop through all the stats of it, of the Pokemon and inside this stat we can extract the stat information, which would be stat name and stat URL. Okay. And the stat name, it's what's interesting for us because it's called HP attack, defense, etc. It's what we, it's what we, we, t um, tagged the, the elements with the attribute, right? So I can just grab this and come here and I can say, okay, the element for that stat, it's going to be data element equals to Pokemon dash and the stat name. Say this stat like this, and now we know that maybe exists, maybe it doesn't, you know, cause this could fail. Imagine that special attack, special attack is not defined here. So this means that it does not exist, so it could fail. So whenever there's no element, we'll just tell to continue the loop. Okay, I can use continue because it's a loop. I'm just saying, hey, just skip this one and move on with the next iteration. And now that we know that this element exists, now we can do the same here and say, okay, if the, actually we don't need this because we know that the element exists. We can say, hey, element.text content, it's going to be stat dot. Oh, it's called base stat or effort. No, base stat. So I want to get the base stat, this. Base stat, and it's a number, so it has to be converted to string. Like this. And we can get rid of all of that. And that's it. Good to go. Cool, but obviously now there's one thing missing, and it's placing this code in here so it can run, right? <laughs> so, um, for now, we just have the code running in home for the home page, but we have to include the code for the Pokemon template page. So we'll have to update the build script, this build script. And in the entry points variable, we can define a new entry point. That's going to be source slash Pokemon template like this. 
and index.ts. And if I rerun again with that server, boom, now we're talking. Okay. But let me clear one second that this folder, let me get rid of everything that it's inside it. And let me rerun again, because I don't want to confuse you guys. See how now we have, um, we have a slight problem. And is that the URL changed a little bit. See how before it was spitting localhost slash index.js. And now we're spitting, uh, spitting out uh, localhost slash home slash index.js and localhost slash Pokemon template slash index.js. And that's just because uh, this is how ESBuild works. ESBuild is the compiler that we use to convert TypeScript into JavaScript. And when you just have one entry point, it returns that single file. But when you have multiple entry points in different folders, then it uses the root folder. So it would be the this folder as the, as the, um, as the serve point and it serves for each of the files. So this means that we will have to update a little bit the home page because instead of being localhost slash index, now it's become localhost slash home slash index. And in the Pokemon template, I can do slash Pokemon template slash index. Cool, let's show it now. You know what's cool about working with TypeScript is that I know that this is going to work <laughs> because um, if somebody was failing, I would know, I would know it because I would have errors in here. I mean, it can still not work, but at least I know that there are no bugs. Maybe I missed something, but I did not write anything wrong. That's for sure. Because TypeScript is not complaining. That's one cool thing about um, working with it. Hey, let's try it. Pokemon. We got to the, um, the list. Let's visit it. Bulbasaur, yeah. Actually, it didn't work exactly because yeah, we had a problem here. Pokemon, it didn't populate these stats. So definitely something, definitely something here. Let me see. Let me console log each element. So it's not grabbing it's not grabbing these elements. Data element equals the poke. Oh, no, it's not stat. It's stat name. Actually, I did a mistake. <laughs> so my bad. Now we talk. Okay, cool. Height, weight, HP, attack, defense, and speed. Boom. I think that we achieved the the goal of today. You know what? I'm, I'm going to create a back button. Just for convenience. To say, you got go back. Also, it's gonna be back by the fire. Boom, boom, and then make it black. And make it oh, maybe too much. Oh, and this has to the homage. Yes, because now it's gonna be a little bit easier to navigate. Okay, so we're done for today. I am, um, we built a template page for all the Pokemon. It was cool. So now each Pokemon uh, can be visited like this. Go to each of one of these Pokemon. Uh, navigate and get the information and go back. And the and over the template page, we're loading dynamically the data just using these uh, ID query brand, which is really, really powerful when we have, you know, a big complex app and you want to load multiple uh, sources of data. So um, next stream, we're going to take this up a little bit extra uh, with the limit uh, I don't know how to call it, a little bit more interactivity, let's call that, in the app. And I'm thinking that we could do something like either create a favoriting system for Pokemons, or maybe we can create our own Pokemons, or maybe we can make the Pokemons battle, because that was one of the original ideas, and I think it's cool to do. You can do just like some simple battles where you pick a couple Pokemons, and then somehow they fight. <laughs> I think that's that's that that, that, that could be fun. So that's going to be next Friday. And after that, we'll decide if we could just building stuff on this app or research topics. So um, thank you for being here with me. Uh, as always, leave a like or a comment if you like this or share it with your friends. And see you next Friday. Thank you.